Reese Rambles, episode 33. And one thing that I should get out of the way immediately is uh, the, uh, the the video thing. Hello. Um, hi, YouTube viewers. You can see my face. Um, yeah, I thought, I'd, I thought I'd try something ever so slightly different for this one. Uh, whether it's going to create a lot of overhead that's going to kind of hold these up, uh, I'm not really sure. But um, yeah, I thought uh, for the benefit of the uh, the viewers on, on Reese Rambles, uh, the YouTube channel, um, I thought, why not hit record on the camera and let people see my face? Now, if you're listening on the usual, um, you know, podcasting platforms, stuff like Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, although I will say if you are listening on, on Google Podcasts, it has been announced this week that that's going to be uh, discontinued in the future. So you might want to find a new podcasting uh, a pod podcast listening platform. Uh, that obviously, there's YouTube Music, which this also goes out to. Uh, and there's Apple and there's a few others that it all gets kind of automatically syndicated out to on the internet somehow in, in ways that I don't understand. But uh, yeah, the primary platform that I use is Spotify. And uh, of course, that, that used to be Anchor originally uh, until Spotify acquired it. And there's actually quite a, quite a funny story about that um, from this week, um, because I thought that I'd actually lost, completely lost this, uh, <laughs> this podcast and completely lost access to it. Um, I was I was reading that you can actually set up multiple podcasts against the same account on Spotify for podcasters. So I thought um, that I'd try to be clever and maybe set one up for uh, you know like the specials and uh, you know kind of one-off things that are not part of the usual kind of weekly service. So I have this uh, this dashboard called uh, Spotify for podcasters, and of course this was originally Anchor FM. And I went on there and I went into the option to uh, create a new podcast and went through the process, just set one up, you know, test podcast or whatever it was called. And Reese Rambles disappeared. Uh, it wasn't available in the dashboard in the back end anymore. And of course, I kind of panicked a bit, um, kind of felt a bit of relief that actually, oh, you know, perhaps I'm finally free from this thing. Um, but um, I thought it, it was probably, you know, in the best interest of my listeners. Also, the um, the uh, America, two-part America special had literally just gone out like the day before. And, um, you know, I didn't want it kind of disappearing off all of the all of the podcast platforms because it was doing quite well. And, and I was having some quite nice chats to people on the Internet about it. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd get in touch with uh, Spotify's customer service, who were excellent. I must say they were very, very helpful and basically pointed out to me that... Uh, I, Partly, partly I'm an idiot, uh, but also partly that, uh, that you know that there's still some transitionary stuff going on that's that's kind of a bit confusing, and um, essentially that uh, I'd created the new podcast against my actual Spotify account that I've had for years, and that Reese Rambles were still quite safely associated with my legacy Anchor FM account. The confusing thing being that if you log in on one, it automatically logs you logs you in on the other. Um, so if I if I logged in on the Spotify account. Uh, all I could see was the new test podcast. If I logged in on the Anchor account, um, I could see Reese Rambles, but that also logged me in on my Spotify account for the purposes of using Spotify, which is incredibly confusing. Um, but yeah, I, I thought, no, the, the, you know, this is complicating things. I'll delete the test podcast. I'll worry about that later on when it comes to it. Uh, and I'll just go back to kind of uploading to uh, Reese Rambles. So there you go. That's a funny story for you today. Uh, and that's uh, that's the uh, the Reese Rambles uh, podcast and how I very very nearly uh, lost access to it. Now I also have an update from the uh, Department of Corrections, aka my wife Catherine, who is an avid listener. Uh, shout out to Catherine. Hello, uh, I'm sure you're listening somewhere, possibly on the treadmill uh, in the garage, possibly in a hotel room on a business trip, um, or wherever it is that you listen. Sometimes in the office, I think. Um, am I allowed to say that? No, she doesn't listen in the office. She, she's a very hard worker. But um, yeah, she was listening to the, the America special that went out uh, last weekend and pointed out to me uh, something that I'd missed. Not, not a mistake as such, although she does like to point out when I make mistakes uh, in, my, in my rambles, um, you know, the, the chronology of things, um, that kind of thing, when I kind of have to think off the top of my head. Because I, I work from a list of bullet points when I record these. Um, and when I did, let's go, let's go off on a little tangent for a moment. Uh, when I did the America special, um, I um, I actually went through my Google Photos and uh, you know kind of, kind of scrolled through, went back to the beginning of the holiday, uh, scrolled through in order, and anything that kind of stood out to me that I thought, oh, that's interesting, I I just added a bullet point in a uh, in a Google Doc. So you know, started at the very beginning with the uh, you know the flight and the the Napa Valley wine train, and then on to uh, you know San Francisco itself and uh, all, all that stuff. And one of the things that I put, one of the bullet, bullet points that I put was. Um, 
you know, a San Francisco cable car, and that was pretty much it. And um, in the ramble, I talked about the cable car and the cable car museum that we stopped off at. And I, I think I, I think I mentioned that the system was over 100 years old, which was just something off the top of my head. And that's true, it is over 100 years old. One very important uh, fact that I missed that would have been really interesting to my listeners is that it's actually the 150th anniversary of the San Francisco cable car system this year, which is why they had you know the, all the fancy exhibition and stuff going on in the museum and why they were kind of pushing people to go to the museum to uh, check out the history of the tram because obviously it's, a, it's an important year. And I kind of neglected to mention that, but um, I think other than that... Um, I don't think she had any other feedback for me, but uh, I just thought that was interesting. And um, it's quite interesting how we ended up at the Cable Car Museum as well, because we, we kind of, we, you know, we were staying uh, in a hotel that was quite close to a cable car stop, and we wanted to go to Fisherman's Wharf, which was the other end of that particular cable car line. So it was very convenient. And of course, you've got to go on the cable car when you go to San Francisco. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of a really big part uh, of the draw of the city, and it's kind of a big uh, tourist thing. So, uh, you know, we decided we'd use the cable car at least one way. Um, as I mentioned in the ramble, we we, uh, yeah, we used Ubers quite a lot to get around because it's just really, really convenient, particularly in San Francisco where uh, where Uber are based. They're just literally everywhere. Um, so we, uh, we we walked one block over and we... we <laughs> the, not all of the cable car stops are, are very well marked, so there was like an island in the middle of the road um, and there was another guy kind of loitering there, and we thought, oh, okay, I guess, I guess this is the stop. This, this was actually the Union Square uh, stop, as it happens. And um, yeah, we, um, <laughs> we kind of loitered on this on this kind of uh, you know small patch of uh, of concrete in the middle of the road with like cars going either side of us. And sure enough, the cable car did stop right by us. And you buy your day ticket on the app, and then you basically like. Uh, I think you you boop the uh, boop your phone against the thing in the cable car and and it, it didn't work for us but they just waved us through anyway so I guess, I guess it quite often doesn't work and um, yeah so we, we we went down to um, Fisherman's Wharf which is where I recorded the uh, Musée Mécanique video which has just gone out on the main channel uh, I will link to that in the usual places and I will uh, I will talk a little bit about that a bit later on in this ramble as well uh, but yeah that's where I recorded the Musée Mécanique video and. Um, yeah, on the, on the way back, we were like, hey, we'll get the cable car back. We'll see if there's much of a queue or, or you know, whatever. And uh, we, th th there was a massive queue and we were kind of right at the back of it. Uh, and when they loaded the cable car up, somehow they managed to cram all of these people into it. And it was just it, it was just standing room on the outside. So we thought, yeah, let, let's hang from the outside of this thing. You know, it, it's kind of part of the uh, part of the experience. And you see some of the locals doing it and some uh, crazy tourists doing it. Was, yeah, let's hang on the outside of the cable car. And um, we kind of got on and it was a few minutes before it left, but we were, we were clinging on for dear life because we thought, well, if we get off and kind of step into the road, you know, what if, I don't know, what if someone comes and takes our space or, you know, what if they, what if we lose our spot or, or what? So we just thought we'd hang on. Um, ended up being a few minutes. And then the cable car set off, and obviously they, they kind of announced the stations as they're coming. And we got to, you know, they said we were at the cable car museum stop. And it's, it's, it's this kind of this small, um, like, brick building on, on a street corner, on a junction. And we kind of looked at each other and we were like, yeah, yeah you know, we've got time. Should we, should we pop into the cable car museum? And so, we, you know, we hopped off. And to be fair, it, it was quite nice to... Um, Get, get off that particular cable car because uh, we'd pick the side that was in the middle of the road um, and these things just, you know, they're just in amongst all the, all the normal traffic and they're moving at like 10 miles an hour and, you know, drivers in San Francisco are a bit crazy as it is. Uh, so to have like giant SUVs passing within inches of your face when you're like clinging on with one arm and, you know, you've got bags of shopping and stuff in the other arm, um, it, it was like, yeah, maybe we should get off. And... Um, yeah, just kind of, kind of on a whim, but we'd, we'd kind of, we'd kind of already sort of, um, you know, discussed it. Thought, yeah, we'll pop into the cable car museum, and it actually ended up being um, one of the most interesting things that we did on the whole holiday. It's absolutely fascinating, and seeing all like the underground workings and stuff, uh, you know, of the cable car system was really, really interesting. So I can highly recommend that. And uh, yeah, that's a that's a correction to my previous ramble. One hundred and fifty years of the cable car, and uh, yes, I apologise to Catherine. I will, uh, I will fact check more thoroughly in the future. So a little bit of news this week in the uh, retro gaming Atari world, and I did mention last time that I wanted to kind of uh, kind of move away from doing um, you know current news and things, but I will mention things as they pop up that uh, you know as they interest me. And yeah, something that was pointed out to me over on 
Mastodon. I am indeed on Mastodon. I'm on all of the social networks. Um, I, I kind of have to be because I have a YouTube channel and I have to kind of grab my name on there so people don't impersonate me. Impersonate me. But also, just as a way of kind of um, you know engaging with people and, and you know en enabling people to contact me. And of course, for uh, for promotional uh, purposes as well, I've got somewhere to post links to my videos, uh, perhaps to people who aren't on YouTube constantly, uh, refreshing the page, waiting for waiting for one of my wonderful uh, submissions to pop up. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm reasonably active over on Mastodon, although I am spread quite thin nowadays with uh, you know threads and Blue Sky and Twitter and Instagram and everything else. I get it, I get it. They're all bullshit. Um, but like I say, I have to be on them. Um, but over on Mastodon, I'm on oldbytes.space, which is a really, really fantastic uh, community for uh, retro uh, creators and um, people interested in retro uh, computing type stuff. And uh, yeah, Boris, Boris Kretzinger, who is a, a long-term follower and supporter of the channel, who goes by the name of Dataset User Online. Uh, hello, Boris. Uh, thank you very much for all your, uh, all your support for the channel over the years. You are a name that I've seen uh, popping up since the very beginning. And uh, he tagged me in a post about this new Atari Game Station, the Atari Game Station Pro. Now, in a previous ramble, I talked about the 2600 Plus, which was a brand new uh, console from Atari, which was, in, you know, it's essentially a, a 21st century take on their classic uh, Atari 2600 console from 1977. And uh, Boris hasn't pointed out uh, the, the Game Station Pro to me, which, which is something I'd kind of seen it mentioned around on the retro gaming sites and stuff. But, you know, I, I've been away on holiday and I, I didn't really pay it much mind, to be honest. But um, on his recommendation, I decided to take a closer look at it. And, yeah, it's kind of more what you would expect from a, uh, you know, a classic uh, mini console type thing. So it actually has games built in, which the 2600 Plus uh, doesn't it's got 200 over 200 games and um yeah it's quite a cool little thing it's got these uh, wireless uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, joysticks it's kind of i'm not really sure what what i would say the styling it kind of looks like one of the you know the zx spectrum with like the heat sinks is that the um is it the toast track I'm, I'm not a spectrum guy sorry but yeah kind, kind of a bit reminiscent of one of those i guess um, but the black and silver, I guess, is kind of inspired by the uh, the Atari XL systems, the 800 XL and, uh, and, and what have you. Um, I think these are just renders on the website. But um, yeah, the, I think the interesting thing, the really interesting thing about this is that it has uh, Atari 5200 games on it. Now, the 5200 was, of course, a console that was released in like 1980. Two. I didn't fact check, check this before I started recording because I never do. Um, one of my favourite consoles by Atari because it's based on sort of the same architecture as their 8-bit home computers, although the cartridges aren't compatible because Atari. And um, yeah, essentially, um, you know, it, it was uh, it was available for uh, it was on the market for less than a year. I actually did a video about this console on my channel, and um, it, it was one of the victims of, of like the Tremels taking over and decided to axe it uh, to concentrate more on home computers and stuff, which is a real shame because it was a very cool thing. And um, it, it's also kind of gone down in history for um, a being absolutely enormous. I mean, when I did the um, Atari um, show and tell thing with Neil from RMC. Um, we compared it to a lot of other consoles, and it's like it's even bigger than the original Xbox. It's, it's an absolute chungus of a console. And um, the other thing that it's kind of known for is having really terrible joysticks, um, which is a little bit unfair because they're analog. Um, they're, they're not self-centering, but um, they're analog, and they work quite well in a few games that benefit from having an analog joystick, like um, Missile Command being one. You know, I love the version of Missile Command on the 5200. I think it's great with those joysticks. But the contacts kind of degrade over time, so the button presses are very sort of hit and miss, unless you um, rebuild yours with the uh, with the gold contact kit, which, I, which I've done for mine. Um, and, um, yeah, it's, um, you know, it, it was just kind of one of those historical oddities. So it's really interesting to see Atari actually acknowledging it for once and releasing a console uh, that, that supports the games from the 5200. So, yeah, it has them built in. I don't know if you have the ability to uh, load up more games onto it. I'm sure that's probably something that people will work out, um, as always happens with these mini consoles. 
And uh, yeah, it also has Atari 2600 and 7800 games, uh, over 200 officially licensed classics. Of course, I'm just reading from the website now. Um, dual 2.4 gigahertz joysticks with integrated paddles and three sensitivity settings. So of course you can uh, you can twist the top of the joystick just like my beloved 2800 controller. Uh, I should also point out that, that Lee uh, from Lee Smith's Workshop has done a follow-up video to that as well. Everything I mentioned in this ramble will be uh, will be linked down in the uh, the usual places. Of course. Uh, but yeah, but it's got the all-in-one uh, joystick and paddle controllers, uh, which look <laughs> quite cool actually. Quite uh, quite nice styling on those. Uh, not really reminiscent of any any other kind of classic Atari uh, controllers, but uh, hey, they you know they're doing their own thing. Uh, RGB lighting, which uh, hopefully you can turn off because I'm not a fan of RGB lighting generally. And uh, yeah, plugs into your TV using HDMI and available for uh, well for delivery. Uh, by October the 31st, which is, uh, you know, it's a month away now, uh, for an RRP of 99.99, which is uh, which is very reasonable for what you get. Anyway, it's an interesting looking thing. I will link to it uh, down in the uh, in the description and in the uh, <coughs> show notes on the podcasting platforms. And yeah, thanks to uh, thanks to Boris for pointing that out to me. Looks like a very cool thing. Not sure if I'll be picking one up. Um, I have ordered a 2600 plus because that does look very cool. I probably should, shouldn't I, for the sake of the channel. I think it's um, justified spending some uh, some Patreon money on this. So, um, yeah, the uh, Atari Game Station Pro. So, on to some uh, behind-the-scenes youtube type stuff, which I'm sure you're all here for. Um, and this kind of comes off the back of a conversation that I had with some fellow uh, YouTube channels. And this... Uh, Obviously, you can't have a conversation with a YouTube channel, uh, but conversations with uh, fellow YouTubers who have their own channels. And um, yeah, it, it was a talk about comments and, and kind of our, our policies towards dealing with comments. And a lot of these guys I was talking to, um, you know, the, 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 their channels are smaller than mine. They don't have as many subscribers and they, they don't get as many comments as I do. Um, and I must say, I, I used to have this policy where, so we have something called YouTube Studio, which we can log into, uh, which is what we use to manage all of our videos and our channel. And, you know, so basically it's, it's where we go to upload videos. Uh, we can see latest comments. We can see analytics on the channel. So we can see how many views we've had and all that kind of stuff. Any copyright strikes against us, obviously we can um, dispute those, stuff like that. Um all that kind of stuff, just anything to do with the YouTube channel. And it's all managed through YouTube Studio. And there's a section in there called Comments. And what happens when you click on that uh, is it, give, it gives you every single comment that you've had on your channel uh, in descending um, chronological order. So you've got the very latest at the top and it goes all the way down to the bottom. Uh, for, for those who are watching this, um, I'm not, I'm not going to show you my uh, comments thing in the back end because you never know what might pop up and... Uh, yeah, whatever. Um, the point being that um, I made a video all about uh, a solar project on my channel, uh, which long-term viewers might be familiar with. It came out just over a year ago, and I'd basically done this DIY project where I put some, uh, you know, put some solar panels on the back of my house and used it to power all the stuff that I do with my channel. And I, well, that video went viral and it had nearly a million views by the time I took it down. And yes, I took it down, even though it was massively successful. Um, and the trouble, up until that point, I'd been going into my comments section every day, um, sometimes, you know, like two or three times in a day, um, and taking the time to sort of read everybody's comments and reply to people and, and that kind of stuff. Even the nasty ones, you know, some, some you do get the very occasional troll when you have a YouTube channel. I've, I've been quite lucky in that they've been, by and large, quite positive. Um, the only real negativity is people kind of nitpicking things and, and you know, call it, trying to call me out and, and say that I'm wrong about un, generally unimportant stuff that 99% of people don't, don't give a shit about. But um, yeah, um, you know, by and large, it, it's been positive. But the solar videos came out, um, you know, first 24 or the initial solar video came out uh, first 24 to 48 hours. Um, it was it was good though you know it was all my kind of usual uh, long term viewers and they were like oh you know this, this this is a bit different but it's really interesting you know I wasn't really sure what to make of it going in but you know thanks thanks for putting this video together kind of thing it's uh, it's really got me thinking about how maybe I could do something similar or and a few people had, of course had already built similar things and were kind of giving their input and it was all really nice and all really pleasant 
Then obviously I, there was that fateful morning when I woke up and noticed that the video was getting like 2000 views per hour. <laughs> and pretty much from that point onwards, I, I'd go into the comment section and there'd, there'd be the occasional one saying, oh, you know, this is great, well done, really looking forward to the rest of this series, I've subscribed to the channel. Um, but there was there was kind of this split. Um, there were, it's kind of, um, so, so, so there was the, the, the solar community itself, um, who either kind of fell into the, the positive or the negative side. Uh, the people on the positive side were encouraging me and saying, oh, you should do this next, you should do that that next. Or they were saying, well, you know, um, I know you're new to all this, but um, I think you should do this bit slightly differently because it's, it's not quite right or it's not quite as safe as it could be or, you know, something like that. All very constructive feedback. Uh, but there are also negative people in the solar community. There, you know, like any community, there's kind of gatekeepy gatekeepy people who are like, oh, you know, who is this idiot? He has no idea what he's doing. He's obviously not done any basic research. Which obviously, I did. But uh, there's so much conflicting information out there, and literally all I did was buy a kit and build it according to the instructions. Um, but yeah, you know, those kind of comments, gatekeeper comments, and people, some some kind of very rude people. Um, <laughs> calling me an idiot and stuff, which is fine, you know, I'm a big boy, I can handle it, it's not a problem. Um, but they they take up a huge amount of time because I was in the habit of replying to, to pretty much everyone. And, you know, even those negative comments, I was sat, sat there and of course I'd have to think for a few minutes and think, right, okay, you know, how am I going to address what they're saying? I need to be polite to them because, I, I, you know, I can't just tell them to piss off or whatever. Um, you know, that, that's not how I want to deal with people, even if they're being rude to me, to my face. And quite often you get comments that you kind of perceive as negative and then you, uh, you know, you reply to them and they end up, uh, you end up having quite a, a sort of civilised uh, conversation with them. Oh, bit of madness there. Um, yeah, you know, and because you've kind of misconstrued what they were saying or maybe there's a language barrier or some kind of cultural difference that, that makes me uh, read their comment and kind of perceive it as a, a as a negative thing when actually it's not. But uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I had comments from the solar community, very positive people, very negative people. And there was another section of comments who were people, I think I've, I've talked about this before, but it's always interesting to, to, to revisit. Um, people who seem to think that YouTube is Reddit or maybe their local newspaper uh, comment section. And they go on there, they go on to youtube.com, uh, they see a big list of topics and they think, solar power, I hate solar power. Solar power is woke. It is uh, part of the agenda of the leftist liberal elite who are trying to take away my way of life or something because of some bullshit they've read in whatever newspaper they read. And so they click on it because they want to make a point of leaving a really nasty comment saying, "Oh yeah, solar power. You're not going. You're not going to save the world. You know. You're not going to. You're not going to save any money. You know." Even though I made it very, very clear in the video that I just wanted to play with it because I thought it was cool, um, and I wanted to generate my own electricity because that's, you know, it's a cool thing to do. Um, and I got more and more of these as time went on, and I got to the point, and I actually, I, you know, some of them got the better of me, and I, I did end up arguing with them and. Some of them, you know, I, I at least tried to be civil in my replies to them and then they'll reply back and just double down and get even nastier. And I, I just thought, I'm wasting my time with this. You know, the, the, this isn't my audience. These aren't my viewers. And this is time I could be spent on other stuff, on work stuff or creative stuff or, you know, working on other videos or whatever. So it was at that point that I stopped checking the main comments um, tab on YouTube Studio. And I haven't checked it since. Uh, you know, that was like a year ago. Um... Because if people are leaving comments on videos that I uploaded, you know, two or three years ago, um, yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of those are going to be, they're going to be good people, they're going to be genuine people, and they're going to be people providing, you know, useful feedback. Uh, quite often, they're people asking questions. The trouble, the trouble with that being that um, if it's something I did two years ago, I, I mean, it, you know, the the stuff that I put in my videos is kind of the sum total of my lot of my knowledge on that given topic um, at that given moment, anyway. Um, but you asked me about it two years later, um, you know, when I've made like a hundred more videos, it's like, I, I, I can't remember. I, I can't remember what I said in that video. I'm not going to go back and watch the entire video to address, you know, one little question that, that you've asked me. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I, I would love to, but it takes up a lot of time and it doesn't really benefit, you know, it benefits that one person, which is great. It's great for them. Um, but it, it doesn't really benefit uh, the world at large. And unfortunately, you have to kind of prioritise these things. But um, 
Yeah, so uh, that's why I've stopped checking. So um, I wanted to talk about, <laughs> this is all a kind of roundabout introduction um, to talking about a, a few big channels that I watch um, who have actually kind of publicly stated their approach to comments and how they deal with them and how that's kind of inspired my own uh, approach going forward, which I, I will talk about uh, after this. So I just wanted to uh, point out the, uh, the, the first channel, uh, it's probably one that, uh, that, that you may have heard of, uh, and that's Mr. Beast. Now, you may not like Mr. Beast. Um, I know I've talk, spoken about him on the on, on Reese Rambles before. Um, but yeah, Mr. Beast, uh, biggest individual creator on YouTube. Uh, as I can see here, he has 187 million subscribers, and in his latest video, uh, he's done uh, $1 versus a billion dollar car, which I haven't watched. In fact, I um, I tend to watch this stuff on TV on my personal account, so um, that's generally why all of this stuff comes up as uh, looking like I haven't watched it because I'm logged into my Control.Reese account at the moment. But um, that's by the by. So um, Mr. Beast has gone on record on uh, in, in a few interviews, and I, I like watching interviews with him because he's he's actually a really smart guy, and he has um, some very interesting thoughts on on YouTube and his kind of motivations for for doing what he does. Um, you know, he's a really interesting chap to listen to, um, and uh, uh, you know, I, I watch like Colin and Samir and a lot of these kind of big uh, YouTuber uh, interview channels anyway, just to see if there's anything I can kind of learn from them. And uh, yeah, he he basically says that um, he used to reply to every single comment that he got on his channel uh, up until the channel was actually quite big. And, uh, you know, he'd actually set aside like a couple of hours every day to just sit down and go through the comments and reply to people and chat to people. When if people replied to him, he'd reply back and, he'd, you know, he'd have a whole conversation with them because he was building a community around his channel. And, uh, you know, th this is exactly how I did things um, before the uh, before the solar video <laughs> blew up. And, um, you know, he, he credits it with with kind of the rapid growth of his channel that he, he built up this he built up this community around it. So. That's certainly one approach. Um, he doesn't do that now. He, he doesn't look at his comments at all now. Um, I mean, can you imagine? It, it, every time you refresh the page, there'd probably be like you know five hundred new comments. So it would just be impossible. And if, if he wanted to employ someone to reply to them, um, you know, he'd probably need a whole team just full time just replying to comments, which isn't uh, you know it, 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 he's at the point where it probably doesn't benefit the channel and doesn't grow the channel. And um, you know, it, it would be. Uh, you know, he will have lost that personal touch anyway because it wouldn't be him replying to the comments. So there you go. Uh, that's one approach. If you want to grow a channel from nothing, definitely uh, build an audience, engage with them uh, and involve them. Um, I do that through Discord now. I have my own Discord server. I've got a really great little community there, um, obviously mainly consisting of my patrons. Uh, I'm on there <laughs> pretty much all day, every day, chatting to people. Um, and they're kind of my OGs and kind of my core audience. And of course, anyone's welcome to join that. And as I mentioned before, um, you know, social media and stuff as well. If you want to, uh, you know, message me on social media, I'll, I'll, I will always check it. I don't necessarily guarantee that I'll reply because it depends what I'm doing at the time uh, when I spot the, spot the messages. But um, yeah, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of how I do it now rather than on YouTube itself. So Mr. Beast engaged with all of his every single comment that he had, every single reply that he had, up to a point where the channel was actually surprisingly big and it was taking him a couple of hours a day. And he saw the value in that because it helped him to grow his channel. So, second example is Casey Neistat. Now, it might be a name that you might know. It's it's certainly someone I've mentioned on the uh, on the rambles before. Casey Neistat was he was um, he was Mr. YouTube before Mr. Beast came along. You know, if you were watching YouTube back sort of 2010 ish. Um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, the very early days of YouTube, uh, Casey Neistat was kind of the first big name on YouTube, the first one to kind of make it really big. Does kind of vlogging style videos. And he's from like an indie film making background. So his videos are very kind of cinematic and, and, and very, um, you know, really well edited and put together, especially considering they're generally just sort of vlogs of stuff of him going about his life in New York. Now, Casey Neistat famously has always from day one and he's been uh, uploading stuff to youtube since 2000 2008 i think um famously has always seen youtube as just a an outlet just just like a publishing channel um, like i say he's from a filmmaking background he's never checked his comments um 
you know, sometimes if he does like a collab with someone else and someone else appears in his video and then they comment on it, he will reply to it because he'll be specifically looking out for that comment from that person. Um, but yeah, famously doesn't check his comments at all. Doesn't reply to them, doesn't upvote them, doesn't heart them, um, doesn't interact with them. Doesn't really, I think doesn't care what people think is, is probably, um, you know, doing him a bit of a disservice. But, um, you know, he, yeah, he, he he's just purely interested in the filmmaking aspect of it and just, you know, putting out videos to that audience and uh, not really building a kind of a two-way thing with that community. And of course, that's entirely up to him. That's that's what he kind of the approach that he wants to take with his channel. So yeah, Casey Neistat, another example of a really huge channel. And uh, yeah, complete opposite. Doesn't look at his doesn't look at his comments at all. Never has. The next one is MKBHD or Marquez Brownlee. Marquez Brownlee, of course, uh, one of the biggest names in tech YouTube, uh, reviews all of the latest uh, phones, iPhones, Samsung phones in particular. But um, you know, he covers all of the uh, the kind of the, the smaller models as well. Famously has a really big, elaborate, uh, fancy studio, which I highly recommend you check out if you can if you can find. Um, I'll try and find a studio tour. Uh, of his uh, and link that in the usual places because it's really impressive to check out what he's built. Um, and he's got like this industrial robot arm that um, he's attached a camera to and he uses it for the, uh, you know, where most people would use like gimbal shots or, um, you know, like, uh, you know, these trolley things to do like slow panning shots. <laughs> he uses an industrial robot arm. And the funny thing is, um, you know, he had one for a couple of years and then the manufacturer of the robot arm got in touch and they were like, oh, by the way, we've got a new model that's got like even more fine grained control. Um, so we upgraded to the new model and it was like $2 million or something for this robot arm that, uh, yeah, they, they stuck a tripod mount on it, <laughs> attached a camera to it and they use it to do like these big sweeping shots of, of phones and stuff, which is really, you know, it, it's one of these things that kind of sets his channel apart from the others, just a really, really high production quality. Now, Marquez, um, quite famously, I think, um, I don't know how widely known it is, but um, he has said before that, um, and, and he does mention it in, in a few of his videos. I don't know if he mentions it in every single video. I don't tend to watch all of his stuff, um, you know, just if something comes up that interests me. But um, he, um, for the first couple of hours after a video launches, he will actually hang around in the comments section and, um, you know, just sit there refreshing it and replying to people and chatting to people. Uh, but only for the first couple of hours. But he, he kind of works that into his kind of daily schedule. So he knows that a video will be going out at you know, 3 p.m. So he'll block out his calendar and say, right, I'm not available 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. because I'm replying to comments, which is a really good way of kind of rewarding those people who who kind of jump on your stuff as soon as it goes out. And it's quite a smart way of doing things. And it's quite a good way for such a big channel because, um, yeah, 17 million subscribers. Um, you know, it's a way for him to kind of engage with that community and, and show that he is still a part of that community and, uh, you know, that he still cares and, and wants to be involved. Um, without it kind of completely taking over his life, which is really smart. Um, so yeah, that's that's a good approach. And uh, in that same vein, and I wanted to give a shout out to Tokyo Lens because it's a kind of a much smaller channel, although you know, eight hundred and sixty thousand subscribers. Makes some really great. Um, he does like documentary style videos around Japan and around Tokyo specifically, but he also does. Uh, like live streams and, and kind of point of view things, vlogging type things as well, just just kind of showing you interesting stuff. And um, yeah, he um, he also takes a very similar approach to Marquez. He has the people that he calls his notification squad, um, who are people who've subscribed and uh, rung the little uh, bell icon on YouTube who get a notification the second the video goes out. And he'll hang around for the first couple of hours and, uh, you know, kind of chat to those people as well, which is... Uh, yeah, I think it's a good approach. It's it's a good balance. And uh, those two have kind of influenced my own um, approach to comments as well on my channel because, you know, I, do, I, I love the community aspect of it. I love chatting to people about this stuff. I mean, ultimately, the people who comment on my videos are people who are like-minded people who are interested in the same kind of stuff that I am. Often, you know, share similar opinions and, and kind of knowledge on these things. And often they know interesting little... Uh, tidbits and stuff that uh, I, I kind of overlooked and you know that you know they share them in a in a friendly way and you know it's really interesting it's, I mean the reason I do this is because I like learning about this stuff so um you know it's great to read those comments but again 
this is just a hobby for me and <laughs> with all the million other things that I have going on it, it has the potential to kind of take over my life um, so I have to be careful about how I approach it so I've kind of taken inspiration from Marquez and, uh, and from uh, Tokyo Lens and so um, it's uh, Norm by the way the name of the uh, Tokyo Lens guy Re really nice uh, Canadian guy uh, but anyway <laughs> that's by the by um, yeah, you know, I've taken inspiration from uh, from Marquez and from, and from Norm. Um, you know, in that I would generally, when I release a video, um, you know, I go to the comments section, uh, the comments tab on that specific video rather than the overall one, and I basically sit and refresh it. And the, the first kind of hour, two hours, you know, four hours, I'll, I'll check it and I'll sort of reply to every single comment, unless it's just someone posting rubbish or spam or whatever and that I don't tend to delete them I can't remember the last time I deleted a comment I don't really believe in censorship and stuff I, I kind of believe in the power of the community to sort of downvote and, and and hide anything that's that's uh you know offensive or rubbish or whatever obviously if it's spam I'll delete it but um you know um I'll, I'll like to take the time to kind of uh you know hot click on that little heart icon icon and you know make it a favorite and uh, you know type out a little reply thanks for watching thanks for you know thanks for the extra information thanks for the feedback or whatever really really nice and i think that's a good approach and i'll generally do that for maybe the first 24 hours first 48 hours and that's the point when youtube kind of starts to push the videos a little bit wider outside of my core audience and um i'm not saying those people don't matter um, you know, I might check back in after a week or whatever and just kind of have a skim through and, and see what's there without necessarily um, interacting with any of it in any way. Um, but yeah, ultimately, you know, it's kind of a way of, of making the people that jump on my video straight away kind of, uh, you know, feel a bit important and a bit special and kind of give something a, a little bit back to them for supporting the channel. Um, and yeah, ultimately, they're kind of the people that are most passionate about this stuff and, and generally provide the best feedback, I think. So um yeah, I think that's a good approach. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to know other people's thoughts on that. Maybe let me know in the uh, in the comment section and stuff in the usual places. Um, but yeah, there's that. And I suppose that brings me all the way back round, and I did did say that I'd mention this again, to the Musée Mécanique video, uh, which was uh, that one I made in San Francisco that I mentioned. And um, I should give a shout out to uh, Lee from Morph and making it again as well, because um, the the original inspiration for that video was um, to submit it as part of his uh, charity live stream thing, which I did talk about uh, last week. But um, anyway, um, yeah. So just just kind of circling back, <laughs> circling back round. Oh my god, that's corporate corporate speak. Just coming back round to uh, <laughs> to that uh, mentioning that um, that video like, uh, as I did earlier. Um, we'll just go. Uh, so. Um, I got some uh, I got some feedback on that, and this was this wasn't actually in the comment section. This was uh, on Blue Sky of all things. Um, from uh, I didn't get the I didn't get the guy's name. Um, I haven't made a note of it, but um, evidently someone who's who's kind of new to my channel. And I mentioned a few machines in this video, um, and I, I'd gone to arcade a site called ArcadeMuseum.com uh, to look up some background information on some of the um, some of the games that I'd played in the video because uh, you know. I like to, uh, if, if I find any interesting little facts and things, I, I like to kind of point those out because they're quite interesting for viewers and, um, you know, a bit of extra content for the video. And a few of them, um, arcademuseum.com said that, um, you know, because people can go on there and they, they can register their collections and they can say, okay, I own this, 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 and this. And arcademuseum.com, for a few of those machines, actually said that um, they only knew of one in existence. And I thought, oh, that's, that's you know, it's all right. It, it doesn't, doesn't, necessarily mean that there is only one in existence um it just means that as far as arcademuseum.com is concerned which is the biggest site the first match on google when you search for these things um as far as they're concerned they only know of one in existence which is i think quite a good indication that these things are very very rare so a couple of the machines i said oh yeah you know according to arcademuseum.com the you know the, there's only one of these in existence so it's very rare and um you know i, I link to all of those in the description and someone spotted this Pike's Peak machine uh, in my video. And um, I, I want to say I'm not calling this guy out. I'm not being a dick or anything like that. We had a really nice chat after this about mechanical, um, you know, arcade games and that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, he, he was just providing some extra information and some extra context, uh, context that I thought was interesting. But, um, 
He said, oh, you, you know, where, where did you get the statistic that there's only one of these? Because I've got one. And, um, you know, I explained it's, it. As as I said in the video, according to arcademuseum.com, there is only one, one of these known in existence. Um, and then, you know, he, he basically said, oh, you know, people don't really use that site anymore and it's quite outdated and yada, 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 which I'd, I'd kind of suspected, but... Um, you know, you, you need you need some way of kind of gauging interest in this without digging into um, all the sort of enthusiast forums and posting and saying, you know, hey guys, how, <laughs> how common is this? And I could have done, I guess, um, but there's only so many hours in the day and there's only so much depth you can go into with a video. Perhaps if I was a full-time YouTuber, it's something I would have um, spent, spent the extra time on. But um, yeah, ended up having a really nice chat with him. Uh, and I did, um, just on the subject of comments, um, I ended up pinning... A comment just explaining that, um, just saying that, um, yeah, you know, where, where I say according to arcademuseum.com, you know, take that with a pinch of salt. That's just what that one site says. And there, there may well be others out there, but basically the, the gist of it is that these things are rare and that's kind of the main takeaway from it. And particularly in, in kind of full working order where you can actually go and, and you know, walk up to them and play them for 25 cents. I mean, it's, it's quite amazing, really, this place. And I, I can really, really recommend it if you, uh, if you want to go and visit. So uh, yeah, that was uh, that was just kind of an aside based on that video. But yeah, I think um, that's all I have for you for this ramble. Um, I know I usually recommend a YouTube channel for people to go and subscribe to in these things or a website for people to go and check out. But um, yeah, I don't know. Don't know what to say. Um, Tokyo Lens. If you like uh, people, if you like nice, um, you know, friendly, gentle, um, you know, you know that that kind of content, um, and you're interested in seeing Japan and perhaps the, the kind of the more rural side of Japan rather than uh, oh my god, you know, anime girls and look at these girls dressed up as maids and oh look at these guys in costumes and you know, um, you know his, his channel is kind of the more kind of human side and the more kind of he, he does a lot of rural stuff and you know rural, rural Japan is a, is a really really kind of beautiful place and uh, you know lots of forests and, and mountains and. All of those things, and um, yeah, so yeah, if you want to check that out, go and check out Tokyo Lens. It's a great channel, and uh, like I say, a really lovely guy as well. But um, that's all I have for you this week. Um, for my uh, my viewers on YouTube, um, this is this is me waving, saying goodbye. Um, for everyone else listening uh, on the podcast platforms, I, I hope my uh, recording hasn't uh, detracted uh, from uh, from the uh, uh, <laughs> from the audio experience because this will is and uh, hopefully or at least for now, always will be uh, a predominantly audio offering. So thank you very much, and uh, that's all I have for you. So, bye.